be with you. It's a wonderful weekend. Many of us have been celebrating Independence Day here in the United States. And I'd like to begin today with one of our songs about the country, My Country, Tis of Thee, number 299. How did you meet? 
And almost every one of them would say the same thing. They would say, well, it was really, really strange. And then they would tell me a story. Today, people meet in lots of other ways. People meet on online dating sites. People meet through email, and so on. I mention all this because today, we're going to read a story of how Isaac got a bride, how he got Rebecca. It's kind of a long story, so hang in there, if you will. It's from Genesis chapter 24. We're going to dip in and out of the story. We're going to begin at verse 34. What's happened is, in those days, there, there was no online that you could go on to. <laughs> Seems odd today. But, but there wasn't, so you couldn't do that. There were no singles wars, so you couldn't do that. And what you did was you sent someone, a servant, off somewhere in order to find somebody. So that's what's going on here. Abraham doesn't want his son to marry a Canaanite woman because he doesn't want to bring Canaanite customs into his, his family. So he sent a servant off to a distant part of the clan. So the servant says, when he comes to that clan, I'm Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master. You get that? My master's rich. He has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, men servants and maid servants, camels and asses, and Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old, and to him he has given all that he has. Are you getting it? He's rich. My master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in his land I dwell, but you shall go to my father's house and to my kindred and take a wife for my son. Well, I'm going to skip some of the back and forth that goes on, and we're going to skip down a little bit. The servant goes on and says, I came today to this spring, and said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now thou wilt prosper the way I go, behold, I'm standing by the spring of water, let the young woman who comes out and draw to whom I shall say, pray, give me a little water from your jar to drink, and you will say to me, drink, and I will draw from your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has a my master's son. Before I had done speaking, in my heart, behold, Rebecca came out with her water jar on her shoulder, and she bent down to the spring and drew. I said, let, pray, let me drink. She quickly let down her jar from her shoulder and said, drink, and I will give your camels drink also. See, their idea of what makes a great wife, <laughs> somebody who's really good, who's strong, and, 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 and able to draw water. I asked her, whose daughter are you? She said, the daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom milk aboard her. So I put the ring on her nose, and the bracelets on her arms, and then I bowed my head, and worshipped the Lord, and blessed the Lord. This isn't quite as good an engagement story, is it, as some of you have. But it's the one that Rebecca gets. Now, he says to her, come if you will deal loyally and truly with my master. So, later, in Bethuel, Rebecca said, The thing comes from the Lord. We cannot speak to you bad or good. Behold, Rebecca speaks for you. Take her and go. Let her be the wife of your master's son. When Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed himself to the earth before the Lord, and the servant brought forth jewelry and silver and gold, and raiment, and gave it to Rebekah, and also gave it to her brother and to her mother. Costly ornaments, this is smart, it's always good to impress your future mother in law. And he and the men who were with him ate and drank, and they spent the night there. And they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? She said, I will go. So they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, be the mother of thousands, of ten thousands. May your descendants possess the gate of those who hate them. And Rebekah and the maids arose and rode upon the camels and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. It's kind of a, it's an engagement story. And underneath all of the language, we 
we see how people are coming together here and how God's word is going forth. Today our psalm is Psalm 46, it's on page 627.
Most of us know something about the story of the Mayflower pilgrims who came from England as separatists, settled on the south shore of Massachusetts Bay, and founded a community which became a foundation for Congregationalism. Less well known is the story of the Arbella and its fleet of ships who came a few years later, landed on Cape Ann to the north side of the bay, and really became the foundation of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Imagine that you were the leader of this group. What would you want to say? People have been seasick. People are scared. People have been missing England and all its comforts. What would you want to tell them about the purpose of this great and dangerous voyage and the founding of this new community? John Winthrop was their leader, and he chose to speak about charity. Charity didn't mean then what it seems to mean now. It didn't mean simply giving some things to someone. It meant the larger business of loving one's neighbor. Winthrop's sermon lifted up Christian love as a practical principle for government. He quoted from the Sermon on the Mount this statement. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel. But on the lampstand, uh, and it gives light to all the house in the same way, let your light shine before others. Winthrop was explicit about the need to support the poor and to make sure each had their needs met. Infused in his sermon was a principle that underlay the congregational way, and ultimately the American, that there is a fundamental dignity, a fundamental purpose inherent in each person, that each person represents a gift of God and it is their responsibility and the responsibility of the whole community to express that gift, to serve God's purpose. When Benjamin Franklin and John Adams, two sons of the Massachusetts colony, went through and founded, gathered with Thomas Jefferson to write the Declaration of Independence that we're celebrating this weekend, they went back to this founding principle. They lifted it up. They said that all are created equal, that all have a human dignity under God, a purpose and a claim on the freedom needed to live out their purpose. Now, that wasn't true of those colonies as they became a new nation. It wasn't true for many, many, many years. It still isn't true in many ways today. But they planted that seed, and throughout American history, has grown up. When people put monuments over it, it shattered the monuments. When people tried to push it aside, it came back. It's like one of those weeds you just can't get rid of. This weekend, we celebrate that moment. And we have to ask, because particularly we, as congregationalists, are the people who come from birth or something. How can we make that a life for all? Jesus also preached the profound value of each person. He summoned those he met, those he heard, to remember who knew the living light of God's word that they had heard from Scripture in their lives. He himself said that he didn't come to destroy the Torah, the law, but to fulfill it. That's what prophets do. You know, prophets are not so much about predicting the future. We, get, we focus on that sometimes. What prophets really do is to take God's gifts in the past, God's word in the past, and bring it to bear on the present. That's the prophetic task. And that's certainly what Jesus did. But he was frustrated. People weren't listening to him. And so he says this, this, this thing we heard today, this little parable about the children. Now, to understand this, you have to understand simply how children play. Just like now, children copy the customs of parents. You know, we do wonderful things in this culture. 
children play with wet and barbie. We have wonderful restaurants. Children have little pretend kitchens that they imagine. We get dressed up. One of the first ways I bonded with Meg was when she was little to play a game called Pretty Pretty Princess. You ever play Pretty Pretty Princess? Well, let me tell you how it goes. You spin something, you go around a board, and you pick up pieces of plastic jewelry, you got earrings, you got necklace. You try not to pick up the black ring because you, you lose if you have a black ring. <clears throat> I don't think they thought I would actually wear the jewelry. <laughs> You know, I think Meg, Meg's very, very smart. And I think Meg thought that when I didn't wear the jewelry, I would lose. But sure enough, I sat down there and played the jewelry with her. And after a while, there I was with pretty little gray earrings and a pretty little gray necklace. And modesty forbids me from telling you how many times I beat her at the game. <laughs> Well, children play. Children play the games of their parents. So what Jesus is asking us to imagine is children who are frustrated because their playmates won't go along with us. They're in the marketplace. And it says, when you pipe, you didn't dance. Everybody knows what happens if you get your pipe going. You're supposed to dance when there's music. There's a, a, a great video somewhere on YouTube that I absolutely love of a busker in London and he's playing um, Queen. He's playing one of Queen's songs. I think he's, he's playing We Are the Champions. And, and, and you see in the video people walking by trying to walk around. And, you know, i got to give the guy credit because he just keeps playing and he's, he's really good at it. He's not pretty Mercury, but you know, he does his thing. And then all of a sudden you see this woman, this, this, this woman, maybe in her 60s, in the background, and she comes up to him. Somebody is old enough to remember Queen. And all of a sudden you see, you're not listening to him and watching him anymore because you're looking at the woman and she's like, <laughs> I love that woman. <laughs> he played and she danced. Jesus says, you're like children. We piped and you didn't dance. What's wrong? We wail. This is pretending to do a funeral. If you ever do a pretend funeral, we've done pretend funerals at my own. Amy and Jason were very little. I think somebody's favorite stuffed animal and we fell apart. And, you know, I, don't, I guess when you have Karen is a plumber. You get your, your safe fix right away, and uh, there are all kinds of other things that happen. But when you have a parent who's a minister, you get to have a pretend funeral for your teddy bear. So we did that. We, we didn't dance, we wailed, we didn't mourn. You get the picture of what's going on in this? People aren't responding the way they should. Jesus has summoned all of here, but they refuse to play. They don't respond. They don't dance. They can't remember the original vision. They're too busy compromising to see the goodness of God. Later, he's going to say, only those who come as children will receive his gift, the peace that makes it possible to lay down on purpose. We celebrated Independence Day this weekend, but in the midst of our red, white, and blue feeling, have we reached back to touch the light? Are we responding? Are we dancing? to the original vision. It's a vision that believes all that gifts. And its genius was always that it gathered us together to share those gifts and make a life doing the work of expressing those gifts. That's what was unique about the American experiment. Other countries were all organized in pyramids, and almost everything went to the people at the top. The American genius was to embrace the gifts of everybody to encourage them. We said from the beginning with Winthrop that everyone had responsibility for everyone else. That's not a political issue. That's a religious issue. 
And our job as churches is to lift up, like prophets, that kind of patriotism that remembers that we're founded on God's vision of a community. And I think we do that most effectively when we demonstrate what such a community looks like. Here's what one community looks like when they did it. In the 5th or 6th century, a monk named Duma led a group of other monks to a place on the Irish coastline. You know what the Irish coastline is like? It's all the fogs and the heaps and there are storms. And they built a monastery there. I think monks like to find a place with really bad climate. <laughs> and, and, and so they built this monastery. And, and after a while, they noticed that on the beach nearby, sailors frequently washed up from shipwrecks on the local reefs. So those monks built a lighthouse. They built a lighthouse, and they staffed it for a thousand years. Now, the monks didn't need a lighthouse. People on land don't need a lighthouse. A lighthouse is a gift to sailors. It's a gift to someone else. It's a way of saying, here you go. Here's a guide. Be safe. It's a concrete expression of being a city set on a hill and a light to all. Every shoal, every reef needs a light. What lighthouses do we need to be building? We know there are dark and dangerous currents in our culture. How can we provide guidance to those caught in them? We know there are rocks in which lies shut up. How can we be ready to rescue the in nature? Sometimes when we think of patriotism, it's just a matter of cheering for our country, our team. But real patriotism is prophetic. What prophets did was to remind everyone about God's purpose. And that's what we should do. Prophetic patriotism has nothing to do with parties or elected officials. It remembers God's purpose and the vision with which we began. It reminds us to watch so that when Jesus comes dancing, we will dance along. When we learn the steps, we will certainly see that he spent his wet his, his whole life going out to those who are lost those who are sick, restoring their ability to live again. We do this as a community. We are patriots, and we are prophets, and we are the light shining out in the world. Now, none of us can do it long. Jesus didn't live long. His first act was to gather a community around him, and we're the successors of that community, his children. So we're meant to live as a life, not as individuals only, but as a community. And you know, when you get a group of people together to do something like that, it's like a band. It's like a choir. And so what I imagine Jesus saying to us as we set out on the task is what every man leader says, what every choir leader says at some point. You know what that is? All together. That's what Jesus means for us. For us all together to be a light, like a city set on a hill. I am. I love thy kingdom, Lord, is our hymn of devotion today, number 503.
Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the way in which your spirit works in communities. We thank you for the way in which you inspire people to lift up each other in communities. We thank you for all those who came before who set out like lamps the principles of freedom, of hope, of care for me. That like our best selves. O Lord, make us indeed in our time, in our place, prophets who remember and share the blessing of your word and your purpose, so that our community as well may be lifted up, so that we may be an example and a light, a place where people look up and say, there, there, the Lord is surely there in that place. Hear us, O Lord. Hear our prayer today for our country, for our leaders, for all of those who today are on the front lines of serving the community as health workers, for the people who lift up those workers and support them, we ask you to keep them safe. We hope that you will turn away this terrible pandemic. Lord, especially today, I want to pray for Miriam, Dave, Margaret, Shirley, Marianne, Jill, Danny, Butch. Are there others? I invite you to take a moment to pray for your own deepest need. And for the need of another. Let's join our hearts and voices together in the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our debts as we give our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. where they can share 
where they can pray. You can support this community and its missions by going to our webpage at firstcongregationalalbany.org and donating online or by sending your gifts to the church at 405 Coil Street or by bringing them to the mail drop at the Coil Street entrance. We continue to ask everyone to wear masks and keep an appropriate distance and we'll continue to broadcast these videos on Sundays. We are going to be open through July and then in August we hope to have broadcasts of other religious discussions. So please tune in Sundays at 10.30 a.m. Today our offering is not going to be passed because that's not safe to do. And so we put offering plates at the back and hope that as you go out, if you didn't as you came in, you will make your offering there at that point. I want to say something about one of our familiar songs, America the Beautiful, because I think it's richer when you know something about its history. America the Beautiful was written by Catherine Lee Bates at the age of 33. She was an English professor at Wellesley College in Massachusetts. And she took a train trip out to Colorado Springs in Colorado to teach a summer school session. Several of the sites on her trip inspired her, and they found their way into a poem, which, uh, <clears throat> including the world's Columbian Exposition Chicago, which is, was called the White City, with its promise of the future contained in the late white buildings. She wrote part of the poem on Pike's Peak, and then she continued to write it as she came home. She wrote it at the Antlers Hotel for the most part, and it was originally published in a magazine, of which at one time I was the editor, although not the Catherine B. Bates published. <laughs> the Congregation is still published, still available today. The first known melody was written for it by Silas Platt, and the poem was published by 1900. Seven years later, there were at least 75 different melodies. There's two of them. And a hymn tune composed in 1882 by Samuel A. Ward, the organist and choir director of Grace Church Newark, was generally considered the best music as early as 1910, and still a popular tune today. Ward was inspired just like Bates. The time came, <clears throat> the tune came to him while he was on a ferry boat trip from Coney Island back to his home in New York City after a leisurely summer day. And he wrote it down and composed the tune for the for the old hymn, O Mother Dear Jerusalem, which I personally have never sung, <laughs> and retitled the work Maternal. It combined Bates Paul, the two were combined and first published in 1910 and titled America the Beautiful. Ward died in 1903, not knowing how important his music would become. Bates lived until 1929 and saw her song become not only popular but had it suggested as a replacement for the Star Spangled Banner as the anthem for the United States. <clears throat> well, that's a bit of history about the song. Let's sing it together. America the Beautiful. 